Hello, this is Tyler Crone with the 36th District Democrats. We are so delighted to have Patrick DePoe with us this afternoon, who is running for lands commissioner. Please, Patrick, introduce yourself to our body. Thank you. My name is Patrick Findays DePoe. My Indian name is Yaeshkin. It means the one everybody knows and talks to. I'm from the northwest tip of Washington State, the actual corner. I can stand out and look at Canada and the Pacific Ocean. Um, we like to call it the beginning of the world. I'm running for the job of Commissioner of Public Lands, but to me, I have to underscore that it's not just a job. To me, we're talking about my heritage, my culture, my, my teachings growing up. I would say when we talk about candidates that are most qualified, throughout my life, throughout my career, I've been on the front lines of land management, shoreline management, fire response, salmon restoration. I currently work at the Department of Natural Resources right now with a direct report to our current commissioner of public lands who has given me her sole endorsement. But I've also been taking the time to recognize something with these uh, interviews and I have to recognize it, that there's never in the history of Washington state or the Pacific Northwest for that matter, been a statewide elected Native American and that blows me away. So to me, this race is definitely about commissioner of public lands, but it goes a little bit deeper. For me, it's also about representation. It's also about diversity. It's also about environmental justice. I mean, I come from a reservation. I currently live here right now. Rural communities surrounded by Forks, Beaver, Port Angeles. You know, the list goes on about, you know, environmental policy and how we see that firsthand. So I'm really excited to jump into this interview with you folks, and thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Patrick. Our first question of the day will be from Barbara. Thank you. <clears throat> the, Patrick, the, Depart the Department of Natural Resources has an important role in generating non-tax revenue for the rest of the state. How will you balance the need to generate trust revenue with other values that state lands provide, such as carbon storage and habitat? I can answer that with a, with reference in a, a very close friend of mine. His name's uh, Willie Frank. He's the chairman of the Nisqually tribe. His father was Billy Frank Jr., a civil rights activist, a very prominent voice for treaty rights and honestly protection of our environment. He helped mold the Forest Practice Board, the TFW relationship back with Drew Bledsoe in the 80s. He also helped mold a process called the Adaptive Management Plan. And that was a way that we can work to basically take a third party science expertise into this process and look at different things that need to be protected at a from a different lens. I would say for us to balance that with our beneficiaries, we have to look at diversifying, you know, and we have the ability to diversify. I've sit on DNR right now in the sense of we've looked at different legislation we put forward this last session to possibly do leases in urban areas. We have over 2,000 acres of land in urban areas that we could help address affordable housing. And so we're doing that right now. Another way for us to start taking in funding and, and really get to the essence of the protection of essential habitat needed for our resources. I understand that from a different perspective because I grew up walking those rivers with my father. I know salmon restoration firsthand. I know the life cycles. I was treasurer of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. I was chairman of the Natural Resource Committee for National Congress of American Indians. I can talk on and on and on about essential habitat and the needs, not just for our fish, but also for our four-legged, also for our winged brothers and sisters. I can go on and on about the, the value that I can bring from firsthand knowledge to this position. But it really gets back down to thinking outside the box and diversifying our portfolio to still continue to, to, to be able to bring that fund into those best beneficiaries that are definitely needing it, especially public schools. COVID is over. A lot of that supplemental funding that was going to public schools is starting to dry up. Teachers were just recently on, on strike. And uh, I know I only have two minutes, so I better be careful about going too deep into this, but yes, diversifying our portfolio and then taking this serious. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next question today will be asked by Stephanie. Thanks. Um, so in recent years, DNR has sought to take new actions to support healthy forests and reduce wildfire risk. What are your thoughts on the steps that have been taken so far? And um, what are your what are you thinking about whether there would be changes or additions that you would bring if you were elected? And relatedly, um, what are your perspectives on the DNR Correctional Camps Program having incarcerated individuals work in wildfire suppression? 
I think we've been taking very positive steps for fire restoration, fire prevention, fire response. Um, I say restoration because we're also talking about our 20-year forest health plan. That is a restoration for seed in a million acres in Washington State. We plan on doing that within 20 years. We're looking at getting it done at half the time. Uh, thanks to legislation 1168 in recent years, we've been able to really bolster our fire response program. In 2014, we lost a million acres of land to wildfires. In 2000, uh, I'm sorry, not just recently as this last year, we had record numbers of wildfires, and we still kept that to under 220,000 acres. 220,000 acres is still a lot. So exploring different ways of, of early response, whether it's AI, whether it's a uh, uh, tree thinning, whether it's a uh, looking at different ways to attack the forest health, but also something that I'm very passionate about is working directly with our tribal partners and bringing that tribal ecolo ecological knowledge into this position. I know the chairman from Colville, I know the chairs from Yakima, I know the chairs from all those different tribes on the east side of the mountains very intimately on a personal level where we have these discussions about areas of prioritize. You call them prescribed burns, but we've called them cultural burns. We've called them prairie burns. These are things that we practice for generations. And being able to merge some of that knowledge into this position, I think, is key. What are my perspectives on DNR correctional camps? Honestly, uh, I I really appreciate them. I've been right out there on the front lines, digging fire lines with these folks. I've been out there chainsaws, cutting, burning trees with them as recent as uh, 2022. And I really appreciated their willingness to be out there, their willingness to to help protect those neighborhoods with us. I was out there when trees were falling on fire and these guys were right next to me, not wavering one bit, putting their lives on the lines to protect our neighborhoods. And I would also wanna underscore that Washington State is the first agency in the nation to pay these folks minimum wage. So I'm very supportive of this program. Thank you so much, Patrick. And thank you so much for your service in that. Our next question will be from Toby. Hi, uh, DNR has a large staff distributed across programs and regions, including seasonal employees. How would you help build strong, effective relationships for staff and teams across the state? And what steps would you take to improve equity and environmental justice outcomes for Washington State? You know, I think this question goes hand in hand with itself in the sense that me running for this position in itself is environmental justice. Me running for this position in itself is diversity and representation. Having somebody that understands that from an intimate perspective, you know, I come from a real community. I come from a, a community that has been had systematically a marginalized voice for generations. Having that true lived experience is essential. And then being able to, to bring DNR employees under one vision understanding the job security, understanding what outreach looks like, understanding what partnership looks like. I would diversify our recruitment. I would start looking to other areas and I have friends that run recruitment firms for minorities. I would start looking into really, really making sure that we're touching all those different bases with all those different communities to make sure that those jobs are being filled by qualified people that may not have had an opportunity to even apply in the past. You know, I've, <laughs> I went to Edmonds Community College and then I went to University of Washington. And I don't say this by any means to uh, to paint a, a different picture, but, you know, I know what it means to get pulled over by the cops and say, where are you going? You know, that's happened to me growing up when I was just going to school at Edmonds Community College. I've been grabbed coming out of stores to show my receipt just because I'm big and I have long hair in areas of uh, rural communities. And, and a lot of that was just misunderstandings, but I've lived that experience firsthand. And I definitely bring that with me. You know, I was the first chair of Washington State's Environmental Justice Council. I've worked through a lot of years with the state, the feds, the cities, the counties, on every level with regards to natural resources and environmental justice. But also bringing that lived experience, there's no replacement for it. And understanding what it means to bring people together and to work together. And I've done that so many different times in my past positions, whether it's PFMC, Pacific Fisheries Management Council, North of Falcon, I've worked with different groups and built those coalitions of folks that don't normally even look and talk to each other because I can understand firsthand what they're dealing with. And I will take up too much airtime again, so I'm going to slow down. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Our last question before we go into follow-ups is from Alex. Yes. Hi. Uh, what do you anticipate will be the biggest challenge you face as lands commissioner, if elected? 
that was a tough one. I've been thinking about that for quite some time, and I would say that, you know, and I think this will be the same for everybody, you know, that is running for this position is honestly recognizing and dealing right away with this climate crisis that we're seeing firsthand. I mean, it's right there. It's in our face. You know, what do we have to do in order to hard decisions that we're going to have to make? If we're true about salmon restoration, then we need to make hard decisions on essential habitat needed. You know, we need to look at what's being done with regards to this administration and Biden committing a, millions of dollars to salmon restoration in our area just recently. We need to understand, you know, those those other endangered species, those lynx and those those different deer and elk that are, you know, needing this this uh this environment just for their survival. And sometimes those decisions are hard and people can get swayed, you know, but once again, coming from a position that I come from and uh being instilled those values and those principles, you know, from my grandma, from my grandpa, from my father, my mother, so on and so forth, my community, it it's not hard for me to make those decisions. And I say that because, you know, I definitely have to answer to folks if elected, I would say when elected. And those folks are my tribal communities that are right here that are not going anywhere that'll check on on me and make sure that I'm doing what is essential to protect their home. And this is something I take very serious. But, you know, looking at what this climate crisis is turning into, you know, and, and being able to adapt, I, I think this is going to be the, the hard part. But at the same time, it's not a challenge that I'm, you know, not ready to jump right into. Thank you so much. We will have a moment here where our board members can raise their hand and ask you a question. And these will be briefer, closer to one minute answers. I see Toby's hand first. Uh, hi, do you, do you think that uh, DNR or slash the state, do you think the state should pick up uh, industrial uh, forest land after they've clear cut it and uh, buy it up to uh, when they, before they dump it on the market? I'm sorry, do you think we should buy up? Do you think, the state, do you think DNR should buy up industrial land that's being uh, converted after clear cuts to non-forest so you can add it to the state's timber base? I like DNR. It depends on what that land's used for. You know, coming from a, a, a community that is uh, bordered by DNR and private land, DNR is way more restrictive than private ownership. DNR has better, DNR is the most regulated and restricted, um, uh, has the most regulated and restricted lands in, in the United States. Um, we have government to government processes with our tribes. We have to take in these different situations that, like I told you, Billy Frank helped set up and made as a, a process to talk about NP typing, to talk about, you know, adaptive management, to talk about, you know, different rest, um, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on the word I'm looking for, riparian protection, you know, and then we could talk about tree canopy, so on and so forth. So I always honestly look to rather having the state as a, uh, a neighbor than a possible private entity, because I know we took that a little bit more, not a little bit, but we took that with uh, greater restrictions. Now, if we're talking about putting this into timber inventory, then there's always a conversation that needs to be had. Is it worth putting in timber inventory or is there essential habitat that needs to be considered? So we have NAPs, we have NRCAs, we have the ability to also look at it from that perspective as well. Thank you so much. I see the next hand is Stephanie's. Thanks, this is a very interesting conversation. Um, I, I also worked at DNR a few years ago, so it's great to hear hear all the um, the work you're doing now. Um, I, one of the things we haven't touched on yet is um, clean energy projects uh, on on state lands, and um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on kind of how to identify ways to move that forward to help with climate mitigation and and sort of weighing that up against lands that should be working lands and lands that should be habitat. Well, in a I've only been at DNR for a year. You know, I'll say that a little bit over a year, but since I have been there, I actually just recently hired another person that's helping me out with uh, identifying alternative energy siting for a map. Um, the reason why that it's been moving so slow is because there hasn't been adequate government to government with tribes. I'm the guy that understands what that adequate government to government looks like. I'm the guy that understands what tribal nations are looking for and protections. I'm the guy that understands their processes and policies because honestly, I helped write some of them. I helped uh, put together a DNR's government to government policy when I was on tribal council and somebody else was in my position. And so being able to, to understand that 
from an intimate perspective, being able to to know exactly what concerns are. If we're talking about offshore wind energy, what are those concerns to, to tribal fishers? You know, they want to know that that's not going to have an impact on salmon. That's not going to have an impact on whales. That's not going to have an impact on halibut, so on and so forth. The last thing anybody wants to see is something like the the dams 2.0 that inadvertent, you know, um, discoveries that happened later on down the line that we weren't expecting. And so I know those because I've sat on that side of the table. And I'm also that guy that can work through those more more fluidly because I understand that. And I understand folks' uh, processes from a <laughs> from a firsthand perspective. Thank you so much, Patrick. Shep? Um, a related question. Um, how are you, how would you balance the needs of leaseholders with um, the the uh, efforts to um, uh, protect the climate and to um, do something good for the for the environment? Well, so, what are we talking about with leaseholders? Well, you have like a lot of people who have leases, say uh, marinas. You have mm -hmm. um, other people who have leases where they're using the land for some commercial purpose. And sometimes that's not uh, aligned with um, the environment, but sometimes it is. And how do you balance that? It really depends on what it is, because I also want to bring up the fact that, you know, I, I, in Nia Bay, I, I've been part of a, I understand this impact of this position that also has on people that live in these rural communities. Unfortunately, I was part of a suicide prevention talks with high school in Forks in 2010 because lack thereof jobs. And if we're not doing things in a sustainable and balanced approach, and that's what I've been saying this whole time, we can impact people's livelihoods. We can impact kids' ability to go to school and afford lunch. We can impact people's ability to put a roof over their head. And so I've been saying that since day one is it has to be about balance. It has to be a sustainability. We have to move forward and not forget about the people that are directly impacted this because then we're creating another environmental justice situation. So if it's with marinas, I've talked to those folks uh, in different uh, committees for marinas. And I said that I'll help facilitate some conversations between, between them and the feds and EPA because there is some things that we can do to help with regards to getting those let's call them derelict structures at this point if things haven't been taken care of in a, in a timely fashion, to get those taken care of where they're scared of basically putting themselves out of a job if they do it right now. Well, there's assistance that DNR has that we could probably try to work with partnerships with the feds to make that happen sooner. Sorry, Tyler, I see your hand going up. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I uh, will call on Alex and I believe this will be our last follow-up point for you. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Tyler. And I just have one, uh, one more question. Um, how do you view the relationship between DNR and the tribes in Washington? Obviously, there's um, there's history between the the department and the tribal lands, given given the history. Um, so I just wanted to know your perspective of that relationship and how would you potentially change the relationship between DNR and the tribes? When we talk about honoring treaty rights and sovereignty and protected treaty areas and protected tribal rights, I know what that means because that's the side of the table that I've been on my whole life. Um, I understand what true government to government means. I understand what consultation means. I help write these policies for different folks. Um, and honestly, it's it's really recognizing and honoring that relationship. I always tell people, if we're going to start off with a land acknowledgement, let's put some action behind that land acknowledgement. Let's not just recognize these folks, but actually let's do something about it. Otherwise, what's an acknowledgement without action? And so I uh, I have a great relationship personally with a lot of folks, but I know there is some issues that have been long stemming for a lot of years that I'm currently working on, whether it's um, uh, access to, to lands in regards to these different TLTs that happen and making sure that tribes don't lose that access. We're working on that currently, trying to find ways, but we're also still subject to statutory law. We're also subject to attorney general's opinions. But finding ways to think outside the box to put different kind of plans together, I helped foster and create one of the first uh, co-management kind of agreements between DNR and Squawks and Island just recently. It's been in the works for 10 years. I got in here for two weeks and figured it out. I found a way to do it because, like I said, I was like, well, you guys are missing A, B, and C. Let's put that in there. And they're like, oh, okay, let's sign it. Squawks and Island was ecstatic. I'm in the middle of doing something else like that for the shorelines in Elwha. We all know about the dam that they got removed. And my bud, my good buddy Raz always says, uh, Russell Hepner is you can no longer call us damn Indians out here. And so uh, working on a management plan that brings them into it on the shorelines in that area, 
of course, they're going to be able to know what's best, but they're also going to be able to assist DNR with lack of capacity. And I saw your hand go up, Tyler. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Patrick, for being with us this afternoon. This concludes the formal part of our interview as we come up on the 20 minute mark. And we will 